Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me and for the warm welcome to this Yankee. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about a transverse invariant from the annular filtration on Kavana homology. Um, and that, so that's a story about transverse links and braids and Kavana homology. Um, in the background, there's a story about three manifolds, contact structures, and floor homology. And maybe that's, um, hopefully, that's more than in the background. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the talk uh, if we have some time. But um, for now, this is a story about braids and transverse links and Kavanaugh homology. So I, so I should start by saying a few words about contact structures. Um, on three manifolds. And, um, ooh, I'm forgetting some other standard and important disclaimers. So um, all the manifolds and maps in here are smooth. Everything's in the smooth category in this talk. Um, and also everything in this talk uh, is joint work with Diana Hubbard, also at Boston College. So a contact structure on a three manifold is a totally non-integrable plane field. So, um, okay, plane field is what you think it is. It assigns uh, a plane to each point in the manifold, or if you like a, a two-dimensional subspace of the uh, tangent space at each point of the manifold, and it's a, a smooth assignment of such uh, subspaces. Um, so so the, the work in this definition is being done by totally non-integrable. Um, and you can express this in, in a number of ways, like the existence of a one form with certain properties. Um, the geometric definition that I like um, is this. If you look at any little open set in your manifold, um, you might hope that there's a surface which cuts through that open set, or maybe just a little patch of a surface, which is tangent to this plane field. Um, so you should be thinking about like a foliation, where you can get a plane field of a, out of a foliation by just looking at the tangent space uh, to each of the foliating surfaces at every point on the manifold. A contact structure does the opposite thing. Um, surfaces are at most tangent on, um, well, they could have a curve that's tangent to the plane field, but uh, you're not going to have a patch of the surface which is tangent to the plane field in an open set. Um, and there's really only one contact structure that I care about in this talk. Um, so maybe we should get that on the board. Uh, it's the cylindrical contact structure. And at every point, it's the span of some tangent vectors. So this is in the, uh, the cylindrical coordinates, hopefully remember from multivariable calculus. Um, so what, what does this look like? We have the, um, the radial direction, the like tangent annular direction, and the vertical direction. So um, let's, let's pretend that I'm the origin, because it's all about me. Um, one of the vectors in the span here is radial. So if we're looking at the plane at this point, uh, it points in the direction of my index finger. And if rho is small, then um, the other vector is basically just a vector that is tangent to, let's see, tangent to the radial vector. So for small rho, and especially for rho equals zero, um, this is basically just the xy plane. But as I move away from the origin, I give more and more weight to the uh, del z component of this vector, so it starts rotating up. And by the time I get far enough from the origin, um, this is basically a vertical plane. And since this definition is rotationally symmetric, um, what you should think of is that far away from the origin, you basically just have a sweep out by uh, very slightly tilted vertical planes. Um, so if you know like a little contact topology, then you know the standard contact structure on R3. 
um, which is usually written in rectangular coordinates and has a nice form. Um, this is contactomorphic to that. So there's a diffeomorphism of R3, which sends this to the one you're familiar with, uh, and that means that their contact topology is the same. This is just a nice, nice way to see uh, some things that'll come up later in the talk. Um, and of course, contact topology starts in, uh, or contact geometry starts in physics and dynamical systems, but um, as it turns out, you can prove purely topological theorems, theorems that don't mention contact structures by studying contact structures on three manifolds. So um, that means they must be something good to study. All right, um, let's talk about links in contact manifolds. Um, so by a link, I mean an embedding of some disjoint union uh, of some number of circles into a three manifold and um, a smooth embedding. And there's sort of two natural conditions that you could put on such an embedding. So one thing you could ask for is that the embedding is everywhere tangent to the plane field. And uh, that's called a Legendrian knot and there's a wonderful rich theory of Legendrian knots. Um, I want sort of the opposite condition. So a link uh, in a manifold with a contact structure is called transverse if uh, it is everywhere transverse to the contact structure. So it cuts through these planes. And as it turns out, there's, there's a really nice connection, um, at least in R3, between contact structure, or I'm sorry, between transverse links and braids. Um, so, okay, a braid, well, um, I don't know, a braid is something that looks like this. It's some strings that go from top to bottom and they're not allowed to backtrack. Um, maybe they have some consistent orientation and uh, we know that they form a group under concatenation. So you take your two braids and uh, put one on top of the other. So they form a group, Bn, where n is the number of strands here. So this is an element of the braid group on three strands. Um, and there's, there's a nice generating set of very simple braids. So if I look at the braid where nothing's happening except that the um, i plus first strand is crossing over the ith strand, um, it turns out that these braids generate the braid group. So Bn is generated by sigma one through sigma n minus one. Um, and there are some sort of basic relations on these. For example, the distant, if I look at like sigma one and sigma eight, they're far away. So uh, they can sort of isotope up and down freely. Um, so that tells you that those two elements in the group will commute. Um, for neighboring generators, there's a more complicated quadratic relation, um, but we won't know, need those so much. These are sort of the, the building blocks of the braid group. So um, there's a natural operation on braids, which connects them to knot theory. That's the idea of a closure. Um, and I'll write for the closure of beta, beta hat. So we're just connecting uh, corresponding endpoints to each other by sort of dragging this rectangle, dragging the top of this rectangle back around to the bottom. So like a, 
I mean, it's a, a theorem of Alexander that um, every link in S3 can be written as a closure. So uh, especially if you like group theory, um, well, OK, we can do not theory by just studying the braid group and understanding the closure operation. And then we're done, and, and not theory is solved. Um, so we should understand the connection between, well, we, we should know, like if I take two different braids and I get that the closures are smoothly isotopic, um, how, how are those two braids related? Um, and Markov tells us exactly how. So there's this stabilization operation, in fact, two different stabilization operations, which are maps from the braid group to the braid group with an additional strand. And the way you add an additional strand to a braid is by sort of linking in the last generator here. Um, but you could do that. You could add the generator or its inverse. And in terms of, of not theory, all you're doing here is putting a right or left twist on the knot, doing a Reitermeister one move. So two braids that are related by a stabilization are going to give you the same link under closure. Um, and that's pretty much the only, only thing we need to worry about here. So Markov's theorem is that braids up to conjugacy and stabilization are the same as links in R3 up to smooth isotopy. And, and conjugacy here you can think of as like a Reitermeister 2 move. Um, so, so this is a, a, a complete set of conditions. And, and for, for group theory, this is like a terrible operation. Um, this isn't a homomorphism. It's just a function. Um, so Markov's theorem tells us that, I mean, of course, braids are used to study links, but that's not going to be an easy task. OK. So uh, what, what we want to do is study transverse links via braids. And so we need a transverse Markov theorem. And this theorem is uh, old enough that you can, you can actually call it classical, and it, it's really meaningful. Um, the transverse Markov theorem, though, is, is pretty new. Um, it's of this century. Um, and it's due to Nancy Wrinkle, and then independently, and within a short period, by Orevkov. and Shevchishin. Um, and I should say that Orevkov and Shevchishin uh, say that Victor Ginsburg proved this 10 years before them, but just neglected to write it down. So uh, write your theorems down, and, and you'll get credit for them. Uh, and what they prove is that braids up to conjugacy and the positive stabilization operation are in one-to-one -one correspondence with transverse links up to transverse isotopy. And um, I guess I didn't say transverse isotopy is, is isotopy through transverse links. So it's a more restrictive condition than smooth isotopy. And um, I, won't, I won't prove this, but I will say that if you, if you go back to the picture I gave you here of the contact structure being essentially vertical planes far from the origin, you can see that that, that sort of gives you a proof in this contact structure. What you should do is um, take your transverse link and isotop it so that it's far away from, uh, from the z-axis. And then, well, that means that it's, it's cutting through these planes and it has to be cutting through them sort of, if, if it backtracked, then it would be at some point tangent to the plane, right? So 
if you pull this thing far away from, uh, from the z-axis, then, then what you're getting is essentially braided around the z-axis. Um, so that's, that's a reason that you should believe this theorem. And um, Okay, so we're doing knot theory. What are the invariants? Well, there's sort of an, an obvious one, which is the smooth link type. I mean, if you're, not, if you're not smoothly isotopic, then you're not transversely isotopic. So that's the first thing you want to check if you want to check whether two links might be transversely isotopic. Another thing you might check is the self-linking number. Um, and this, this is something that's very easy to compute with the transverse Markov theorem in hand. Um, so let's call this SL. The self-linking number of a braid closure is the exponent number of that braid minus the number of strands. Um, exponent number means uh, like the sums of the powers when you write this thing in terms of the standard generators. So it's something like the writhe in, in knot theory terms. So this is something that you can just, you know, you, you take your word and you sit down and compute it, and you can check whether uh, two links are maybe transversely isotopic. And these are referred to as the classical invariants because they're old. Um, and there are, there are non-classical invariants. So they come, for example, from um, maybe... I should say, from not floor homology. There's a transverse invariant. Um, from what's called not contact homology. There's a whole homology theory called transverse homology, um, which is an invariant of, of transverse links, appropriately enough. And also from Kavanaugh homology. And these are better than classical in the sense that um, there are links which are not transversely isotopic but they are indistinguishable from the classical invariants, they are distinguishable from using these two invariants, either of these two invariants. Um, so the, the vocab word here is effective. They are effective invariants because they're better than these two. Um, the invariant I'm gonna tell you about today is related to Kavanaugh homology, and I should say that the, what's called the transverse element in Kavanaugh homology um, it's an open question whether it's effective or not. Um, it's sort of not known. It's at least as good as these two, but there's, um, it's not known whether it's better. So, so the other thing that, that I think this illustrates is that um, you go from smooth link type, which is something you have plenty of invariants to work with. Self-linking number is very easy to compute from a braid. Um, and if you want non-classical invariants, well, I'm not claiming that these are the only ones, but you sort of jump to floor homology. Um, so that, that tells you that this is, this is a hard problem. What I like about Kavan homology is I can give you a rough idea of how it works by the end of the talk. Um, so it would be nice to have some, some effective transverse invariants from Kavan homology. Uh, why don't I tell you what Kavan homology is, roughly? So um, everything I'm going to tell you today 
is with mod 2 coefficients. Although um, a lot of it ought to extend to z coefficients without too much trouble. But we get a lot out of mod 2 coefficients, so let's stick with them. Um, so we start with a link, any link, or any link, a link that we're not necessarily thinking of a contact structure right now. So just a link uh, L in R3 with a diagram. And what we get from the, the Kavanaugh machine is a chain complex. So vector space differential. Um, and the homology of this chain complex is called Kavanaugh homology, and it's a link invariant. It doesn't depend on the diagram, so I'm justified in, in leaving it out. So let me give you a rough idea of, of how this works. We have this sort of essential vector space V, which is the span of these two symbols, V plus and V minus. And the vector space assigned to some uh, collection of flat circles in the plane, so a crossing list diagram of an unlink, is a tensor power of V, um, where the tensor power is the number of components. And this, this is an extremely concrete vector space, um, tensor product even. Uh, a simple tensor in here looks like Just a, like a labeling of these with pluses or minuses. So if I, if I fix some order on the circles, then go, all right, plus, minus, plus. Corresponds to that simple tensor. So we're just labeling circles with pluses and minuses. The hard part, or the, the more involved part, uh, comes when we have a diagram with some crossings. So let me show you an evocative example. And since we're, we're supposed to be talking about braids and braid closures, let me show you an example with a braid closure. And um, for later, let's mark the braid axis. OK, so this is a, a two-crossing diagram. Um, we have sigma 1 and sigma 2 inverse. And so um, the, the standard story here is that when you have a crossing, there are two resolutions of that crossing, so ways to alter the diagram locally so that there isn't a crossing anymore. One of them looks like this, and the other one looks like that. And I'm going to call this 0 and this 1, or sometimes you'll see uh, A and B. And for the negative generator, I swap them. So now this is 0, and this is 1. So, OK, there are two crossings. There are two resolutions for each crossing. So my finite math students will tell you that there are four possible ways to resolve this entire diagram by picking a resolution at each crossing. So one of them looks like this. Here I'm picking the zero resolution at each crossing. So, um, well, just ordering these from top to bottom, I could call this the zero, zero resolution. And then I can go through changing these from zero resolutions to one resolutions. So, um, well, the zero, one resolution is particularly simple because I change that crossing. 
or that resolution rather. So I just get three circles. And over here, this is one zero. One, one. So once we resolve all of the crossings, um, well, there are no more crossings left, so every one of these diagrams can be assigned one of these vector spaces. To have a homology theory, I need maps. And notice that if I draw arrows between um, resolutions that differ in a single component, then I get this nice square. Or diamond. If there were three crossings on this diagram, then um, those resolutions are going to be indexed by three zeros or ones. Um, and if you start writing them out, then you again get, well, instead of a square, you get a cube. And if you had 18 crossings, then uh, you're going to get an 18-dimensional cube of resolutions. Um, and the maps here are defined along the short edges. And they come about by just looking at the ways that these two diagrams differ. So these two only differ in this crossing. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. I'm going to look at uh, what happens to the minus minus element under this map, rather than telling you exactly what all the maps are and could be. Um, to get from here to here, I merge these two circles together. So there is a map that is assigned to the merge operation between two circles, or rather the vector space that is assigned to those two circles, to the vector space that's assigned to this single circle. And it sends this element to zero. This is a merge map. And if you'd like, you could think that there's, um, uh, this is like your, a multiplication map in some kind of exterior algebra. So we're multiplying the graded pieces together, and we should get zero. Um, on the other hand, to get from 0, 0 to 0, 1, I change this crossing to be straight. And that's actually splitting this circle, which almost wraps around the braid axis, to be two circles. So for this outer circle, nothing happens. It just sort of minds its own business. And then for this one that splits, uh, well, it turns out that the split map sends minus to minus minus. And you can find these maps. These are purely linear algebraic maps, um, totally combinatorial, and you can find them in any introduction to Kibana homology. So um, what, what is the Kavanov chain complex? It's the direct sum of all of the vector spaces up there and the direct sum of all the maps assigned to edges. And what Kavanov shows is that that's a chain complex and a link invariant. Um, and again, I'm, I'm drawing this braid axis, but I haven't done anything with it yet. OK. There is um, an annular filtration on Kavanov homology when we're looking specifically at a diagram of a braid closure. So, so where is this annulus? Remember that, that I said that you get a braid closure sort of by taking the rectangle containing the braid and pulling one side around to the other. So of course, <coughs> um, that's an annulus. And um, what I'm actually, the way we get this filtration is by picking some simple closed curve <coughs> from the inner radius to the outer radius, or inner edge to the outer edge. Um, and it doesn't really matter which one you pick, so let's pick that one. And, uh, I don't really want to have to draw this annulus on all of these diagrams, so I'm just going to think of this as a chord from uh, the braid axis out to infinity. So let's put that on all of our diagrams.
So when I start thinking in terms of this chord or of um, sort of just, just putting, puncturing this thing at the braid axis, there are circles that are homotopically trivial and there are circles that are homotopically non-trivial. So for example, um, this circle contracts to a point in the complement of the braid axis. This one doesn't. This resolution has three circles, none of which are trivial in the complement of the braid axis. And that's, that's how we define the annular filtration. Um, so let's first suppose that um, we have some element in the Kavanaugh homology, the Kavanaugh chain complex of a braid closure diagram. Um, and that this element is a generator, and, and you know, when we talk about generators of, of the Kavanaugh chain complex, we mean labelings like this, not just any old generator. Then you define this function k. This is the number of plus labeled, <laughs> bless you, non trivial circles minus the number of minus labeled non trivial circles. So in Kavanaugh homology, I haven't said anything about gratings in this theory, and, and there's a lot that one could say. One of the gratings um, essentially comes from adding up pluses and minuses, so this would have grading negative three up to some kind of shift. Um, this is like doing that, except I only count circles that wrap non-trivially around the braid axis. Um, well, that's for generators. For any element of this complex, um, well, we have a set of generators um, so that y is the sum, I mean, so, so we have generators of a vector space, so we can write everything in terms of those generators. Uh, and since we're working mod two, that's just like, is each generator in the set or isn't it? And the K grading of an element is the maximum K grading of uh, of all of those generators. So write it as a sum of generators. What's the highest possible filtration in those generators? So I guess I should say, sorry, a minimal set. So there's sort of a fundamental theorem, which is what was done in, in uh, much greater generality than what I'll say here by Asaida Apologies. Shatisky and Sakura, and then um, so, so they, they talk about a filtration for surfaces, lots of surfaces, not just annuli. Um, the case of an annulus and, and braid closures was really focused on and made very concrete by Roberts. And here's what they prove. So first of all, K is a filtration on the Kavanov complex of a braid closure. In other words, um, when I apply the differential to x, I get a k which is smaller than what I started with. So it can decrease the k grading uh, or preserve the k grading but never increase it. Furthermore, um, Let's write 
partial zero for the part of the differential which preserves k. Um, then this complex or this vector space with this map is a complex and its homology is a uh, an invariant of annular links or up to annular isotopy. So any isotopy you can do without crossing the braid axis. In particular, uh, it's an invariant of uh, conjugacy classes of braids. And finally, there's a spectral sequence from the homology with this restricted differential to the Kavanaugh homology of the link. Let me just say a few words about why these are true. Um, this is something that you can check sort of case by case. So look at all the possible diagrams you could have of merges and splits in the presence of a braid axis and just check. Uh, check the maps in Kavanaugh homology and check whether they're filtered or not, and they are. The second and third parts of this theorem, um, as I've stated them, are really just constructions from algebra. So if you have a bounded filtration uh, on a complex, then th these two things sort of fall out naturally. In particular, you have a spectral sequence from this object, which in the algebra literature is called the associated graded object of this filtered complex. There's a spectral sequence from the associated graded object to the homology of the entire complex with the entire differential. And because we're working over uh, Z mod 2Z, um, there's no like homological algebra difficulties in just saying that things are isomorphic. And um, I should say that there's sort of a conjecture that's been in the air that the spectral sequence collapses on the second page. So what that means is that um, you do the spectral sequence thing, and by the time you get to page two, you already have Kavanaugh homology, and you're done. Um, so that's a conjecture that's sort of been in the air, and that um, Hunt, Keese, Lakata, and Morrison um, recently put down on paper, and we'll come back to it in a moment. Um, I should also say that this associated graded object is what's called annular Kavanaugh homology, or sutured Kavanaugh homology, or sutured annular Kavanaugh homology. Um, and it's an object that's been studied a lot in braid theory, and also, oop, sorry Diana, and also representation theory um, by Ellie Grigsby and Stefan Verley and plenty of others. So it's, um, it's an interesting object, but it's not one that we really really need for this talk. Okay, so, so what is this, this transverse invariant from Kavanaugh homology? Well, it's written psi of the braid closure, and it's the element of the unique braid-like resolution 
of beta with all v minus labels. Um, so what does this mean? Well, when you do this cube of resolutions gadget, there's only going to be one resolution which is itself a braid, or immediately a braid. And that's because with the pictures of the resolutions that I just erased, um, there is one resolution which looks like a braid and one resolution which doesn't. It depends on whether you're looking at a positive or negative generator. So um, there's a unique braid-like resolution and we're looking at the element that has all V minus labels. So in fact, the invariant has been on the board the whole time. Um, so here it is. Put that in red. It's a very concrete object. And uh, what Plobinevskaya showed is, well, one, psi beta is a cycle. Differential is always zero. Two, psi beta is a transverse invariant. And three, if beta is a negative stabilization, by which I mean um, it's either the direct result of negative stabilization or it's a conjugate of a negative stabilization, then psi is also a boundary. Homology class is zero. And um, if you know a little bit about the maps in Kavanaugh homology, the, the proof is basically on the board already. Um, I told you that whenever you merge two minuses, you get zero. Well, no matter how big your braid is, the only map out of this resolution, the only maps out of this resolution are merges between these adjacent circles. And if I label them with minuses, then the differential is going to vanish. Um, let me skip to the third part here. If beta is a negative stabilization, then that cycle should also be a boundary, and you can see that this element maps to psi. And that's, this is sort of the, the universal picture which proves that theorem. Whenever you have this extra negative crossing here, you're always going to have a picture that looks like this. Just resolve everything else so that it's braid-like and keep this last crossing uh, unbraid like label everything with a minus, there can't be any other maps out of that for exactly the same reason as there can't be out of this, except this map. So, and that, that property is preserved under conjugation. So um, if beta is a negative stabilization, then it's also a boundary. Um, I won't prove two, or wave my hands at two even, um, but let me just say what it means. If you have um, so, so this story I told you is about merges and splits, but there's really a story, a beautiful story, um, about cobordisms here. And so what that second statement means is if you have two braids that are conjugate um, or are related by positive stabilization, there's a canonical set of cobordisms relating their diagrams and maps that are assigned to those cobordisms. And those maps carry psi of one braid closure to psi of the other. But um, as I said, it's an open question whether this is any better than the self-linking number. Um, it turns out that the, the quantum grading of this element is the self-linking number, so it detects the self-linking number. Um, but we don't know if it's any better. I stored all my erasers away. So um, let's, let's think one more time about the stabilization. Let's note that uh, psi 
is the unique element of the Kavanov chain complex with minimal k. Because you can't, you can't get any lower than having all non-trivial circles and labeling them all with minuses. So uh, let's write fi for the ith filtered part uh, of the Kamanov chain complex of some braid closure, then if I go all the way down to the lowest possible k, this is just spanned by psi. And then, well, this is a filtration, so the idea is that I have this nested sequence of subcomplexes until I get to the highest possible k grading, and then I've included everything. Um, and, uh, ooh, sorry, uh, it's, it, it's not hard to verify that the K grading of elements can only vary by even numbers, so there's no reason to write the uh, intermediate ones here. So, I mean, suppose that this cycle is also a boundary. It's not a boundary here because it's the only element in this subcomplex. So uh, somewhere between here and here, it becomes a boundary. There is some element which kills it. So question. Uh, if this homology class dies, when? By which I mean sort of when in that filtration. Um, well, let's, turns out that the, the answer gives you an interesting invariant of conjugacy classes. So again, suppose that psi of beta is zero. We define kappa of beta to be the minimum filtration level so that psi equals zero as an element of the homology of that level. So forgive the abusive notation here. Um, what we want to know is if I keep including this in successive subcomplexes, at some point, the map induced on homology is going to vanish. What's the lowest filtration at which that happens? And for normalization purposes, um, we add the braid index at the end. So uh, let's say for beta in the n strand braid group. And uh, well, if this doesn't vanish, then we could say that kappa is infinity. And you get sort of sensible statements, but we don't, we don't have much more to say about that. So leave that out. All right. And what we prove is the following. So kappa is a conjugacy class invariant. Two is if beta is a negative stabilization in the same sense that I said before, then kappa of beta is two. And uh, it's, a, it's a direct consequence of the definition that two is the minimal possible value. So if psi vanishes for sort of the obvious reason, then kappa is two. And all right, this is a conjugacy class invariant. So uh, it would be a transverse invariant if it were invariant under positive stabilization. But 
if beta prime um, is the result of positive stabilization on beta, then we have that inequality. And uh, I should say that this case can attain. So not a transverse invariant. Because it can go up under a positive stabilization, sadly, very sadly. Um, but there are s a lot of things that this conjugacy class invariant can do. Um, so let me tell you about a few of them. One of them is that if we define kappa min to be the minimum kappa of all braids which close to L as a transverse link, um, then kappa min is a transverse invariant. For sort of, I mean, it's the minimum, so it can't rise under stabilization. And when you see um, an invariant of links that is defined as a minimum over all possible diagrams or braids or whatever, um, you, should, you should be very suspicious of it because maybe there's no hope of computing it. Um, and while I don't know how much hope there is of computing it at the moment, I, I will say this. Um, there is be a little more precise. So there's this family of braids, an infinite family of braids. And they're just four braids. So that kappa of A equals four, kappa of B equals two for A and B in zero up to three. And um, for, for higher numbers, we don't know. Um, this computation comes from a computer program I wrote. Um, but uh, this, is, this is what we do know. And I should say this is significant because um, A and B are smoothly isotopic. And the self-linking number for fixed A and B, sorry, for fixed little a and b, they have the same self-linking number. And b is a, um, well, it's a minimum, minimal diagram uh, of this braid under a few different criteria of that. So it certainly seems like this invariant um, is an effective invariant. There's some evidence to suggest that it's an effective invariant. It tells these two apart. And um, I should say that these two, this family of braids comes from a paper by uh, Tirsan Conduit and Lenny Ng. Um, and I'm happy to show you the formulas after this, but um, they're four strand braids that depend on A and B. Um, what else can we do with this? Uh, well, how about something in the realm of like classical knot or braid theory? Um, Kappa solves the word problem.
in the braid group um, in the following sense. Um, if kappa of beta is not equal to 2 and kappa of the mirror of beta is not equal to 2, then beta is the identity element in the braid group. Um, this follows from the fact that psi solves the word problem. Um, but it's interesting, well, it, the proof is roughly the same as the fact that psi solves the word problem. But it's interesting to note, in thinking of this in terms of a filtered complex, the point here is that you really only need to look at this first, at like the third page of this spectral sequence to tell whether or not you're looking at uh, the identity braid. You don't have to look all the way down the spectral sequence or at the homology of the whole con uh, complex. You get all that information on just the third page. And um, there are some other classical things we can prove with this, like, um, or, or classical facts we can prove like this, like um, these two braids are related by a negative flip. Yeah. Should yeah. Kappa mins? The kappa min a, a, b? No, no. Um, um, good question. This is, this is, I put this braid into a program which computes kappa, and it tells me that it's four and that this is two. Um, I can't prove that oh. the minimums are four and two. I just very much like to. When I said that this is a minimal braid, I didn't say that as a proof that the minimum has to be that. Um, but this is, I take this as numerical evidence that the minimum could tell these apart. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, well, since this rises under positive stabilization, um, if you think, for example, about a positive flip, then it's a, or a positive, well, or just an exchange move, then it's a classical fact that you can write a flip as a um, composition of a positive stabilization and then isotopy and then positive destabilization. Well, the most that can happen is that kappa goes up by two in that sequence of moves. So you can sort of bound the uh, like distance in terms of number of exchange moves between two braids by computing kappa. Um, there's one more non-classical fact um, I'd like to tell you, which is that kappa of beta is a lower bound on the length of the spectral sequence from uh, what's called annular Kavanaugh homology to Kavanaugh homology, the spectral sequence that I put on the other board 10 minutes ago. Um, and you should believe this because this has something to do with the, the length of the filtration you need to go before you see psi actually vanish. Um, so if psi, if it like takes a while for psi to vanish, then the spectral sequence machine doesn't see that it vanishes for a long time. So it's a, it's a lower bound. And in particular, um, the, uh, well, the conjecture that I wrote over there is false and this uh, at least for these 16 braids the spectral sequence takes at least four pages to collapse um, so there are lots of things I'd like to do like uh, have some way maybe a lower bound on kappa min um, and also prove that this spectral sequence has unbounded length. Um, and we'd like to do that by thinking about the connection with contact structures and floor homology, which I'd be happy to tell you about after the, the talk. And thanks for listening. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, uh, I was asked to show a picture of one of these braids, and uh, I'll do this like a 
like a grade school classroom <laughs> maybe. Um, I mean, it looks like this. Um, these are two braids and, and the, only <laughs> the only difference, I swear this is better than me trying to write them on the board right now. <laughs> um, the only difference between these two braids comes at the bottom where there's this block of crossings here and here which have been switched and that's the result of a flipe. Um, so they don't have so many crossings, but when you, the, the length of the braid grows linearly in A and B, and um, it seems like the size of the computation, at least as my program does it, grows exponentially or, I don't know, something really bad, uh, factorially, in the length of the braid, um, and in particular in the number of, of negative crossings. So um, after three, my laptop gets mad. But um, yeah, that's what they look like. And if you know of braids which are thought to be, if you know of families which are thought to be transversely non-simple but not known to be transversely non-simple, we would very much like to know about them and see if this tells them apart. <laughs>